I was born in Austin, Texas on November 6th in 1924. An interesting highlight is that uh, my father was a big Texas supporter and uh, two weeks after that game, I mean after I was born, he went to the Texas A&M football game at Memorial Stadium and uh, my mother was not all that happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> my father was trained as a civil engineer uh, and at that time he was state highway engineer. Uh, in, in Austin. This was a state department that ran the, the highways. In uh, 1936, which was the uh, centennial of Texas independence, uh, they published a, a map of highway map of Texas and he had written a song called Texas Overall and that was printed in that map and so over a million copies of his song were published and distributed, which is a record probably. <laughs> The earliest memory is probably when we lived in Austin and uh, probably when my mother was trying to get her Buick started and it wouldn't start and she would sit in there and say, dog, take it, da da da. <laughs> and uh, I remember, remember that. And uh, uh, beyond that, uh, probably just uh, living in, in Austin on. Uh, Twelfth Street on uh, what was that Enfield Road at that point I think right near the old uh, uh, what was it the the old uh, what would be we called it honky tonk it was a tower it was a, I don't remember the name of it but it was it was right then there well uh, as child we would play I had a backdoor neighbor that was uh, a friend of mine and we would play uh, back and forth that way. Uh, and uh, then, uh, of course, we had school friends. I went to Pease Elementary School, which was uh, not far up across from the old Austin High School, and uh, we played with them. And uh, I, uh, I guess that was the, the main play thing. So I guess we played cowboys and Indians. I remember uh, uh, one time that my parents had been on vacation, and uh, I was up on the roof of the garage when they drove in and, <laughs> and they'd been gone for weeks and my mother was just, you know, gosh, I can't wait to see my son Henry. And I sort of <laughs> waved, waved at her and, uh, and didn't, <laughs> didn't go down to see her or anything. She, she was not happy. <laughs> well, uh, there, was, uh, there was junior high and high school in Austin at that time and uh, we had moved uh, by then to a uh, uh, house up on uh, Enfield Road and 29th Street, a very nice house. And uh, we went to uh, the, uh, the, the junior high, which was out at the University of Texas. It was sort of a uh, pilot program of the university's education bit. And uh, so I went there for probably a semester or two and then uh, the Austin School District changed their boundaries. And I didn't move, but I was all of a sudden in a new boundary and had to go to the junior high school in downtown Austin, which was kind of like uh, going to East Dallas, West Dallas or something in our, in our mind. And we, well, mother fussed at that, but I still had to go there. <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be okay, but it was, it was not the, the you know, the, uh, the exemplary high school that, that I'd been going to, but just about then we moved to College Station, so all of that went away. Well, my father, as I said, was trained as a civil engineer, and he was hired to be the Dean of Engineering at Texas A&M. This was in the summer of 1937, so I was at that time 12 years old, and uh, we, as I said, had just built a nice new house in Austin and moved to College Station, which was, uh, I don't think, I'd never been there, mother had never been there, and uh, so we moved to College Station. The, uh, the university provided, it was then a college, the university provided housing on campus for a lot of people, so we first moved into a small uh, frame uh, house on uh, Welburn Road, and, but part of the deal that uh, Dad had made with the college was they would build him a house. For the, for the Dean of Engineering, and that house still stands, and it's uh, we've been in it a number of times. So it was uh, 
it turned out to be okay. We, we survived and, and really it was a very pleasant experience at College Station. On, on my father's side, lived in Wills Point, that's where he was raised. He was a banker and a merchant, so he had a, a store and, a, and ran a bank in, uh, in Wills Point. And we visited uh, that area and uh, I think probably those, some of those buildings are still standing, I'm pretty sure. Uh, my, uh, my mother's father, my grandfather, was a, a doctor in East Texas. Of all things, he was gored by a bull and bled to death. He knew he was severely injured, tried to get help, but people just kind of ignored him, and he, he, he bled to death as a result of being gored by a bull in East Texas, near Emory, Texas. <laughs> I spent one year back in, in elementary school uh, when we moved to College Station because I didn't have a junior high. But then they had the high school, and they had just built the new high school in College Station on Jersey Drive, which was a uh, nice building. It was connected by the curved, covered walk with a, another building that had the shop in it, because industrial education and shop was big deal back in those days. And then the, the, that was the high school. But the grade schools were in separate buildings on the same campus, but uh, each, each grade had its own separate building, and uh, they were termed uh, the chicken coops by the local people. The, the years in high school, uh, of course, as, uh, I remember uh, uh, I played basketball. I was on the basketball team, <laughs> of all things, and I actually lettered two years, but uh, was never very good. I didn't try football. I was not the right size for football. But then uh, this uh, friend of mine, Dillard Spriggs, and I started this newspaper called The Roundup. And we, uh, we published that probably once a month. It was commercially printed, not mimeographed or anything like that. We sold ads to the local merchants and uh, uh, it, it pretty much sustained itself as best I remember because I didn't have funds to sustain a, a publishing empire at that time, but it was it was a lot of fun and we did that uh, for probably two years. It was uh, pretty well accepted by the school administrators and uh, after maybe a year they folded the other paper and we became the official newspaper of the high school. We were granted access to a, sort of a big closet that was the that sold snacks during the noon hour, and so we were able to run that and use that profit to help pay for the, for the paper. I don't know how this really came about. I probably was influenced by my father, who uh, dealt with a lot of lawyers in his er career, and uh, so it kind of developed that I was going to take civil engineering, which was his field, undergraduate, and then go to law school. So. Uh, I was not a rebellious uh, child, and that's just kind of the way it developed, and so uh, that's what happened. The, the years in high school, uh, of course, as uh, I remember, uh, uh, I played basketball. I was on the basketball team, <laughs> of all things, and I actually lettered two years, but uh, was never very good. I didn't try football. I was not the right size for football. So on that day in December 7, 1941, I was at a movie uh, at the Campus Theater, which is still there on campus, uh, watching a movie. The movie was The Yank in the RAF starring Betty Grable. And I still remember that because of the event. And uh, after they, they interrupted the movie to make this announcement about Pearl Harbor, and uh, uh, we all stood up and sung the Aggie War Hymn, which we assumed would uh, take care of the whole situation. <laughs> that, was, that was my memory of, of Pearl Harbor. I uh, enrolled in college in, uh, in the summer of 1942. Ordinarily I would have gone in, uh, in, in September when they started college, but because of the, of the, of the war effort, most of the junior class left A&M in the spring 
and went into the army. Because they were all, virtually all were in the reserves because this was just the way it was at A&M as a military college. Uh, and so uh, we started uh, in college in that summer. I was a freshman uh, and I enrolled in something called the Army Specialized Training Program which was a government program which was designed to let you complete your education and then go and serve in the war. So uh, I went and started uh, in uh, in and went that year and then uh, at the uh, in the part of that program uh, others and myself were sent to basic training as a first thing and we went to I went to uh, Camp Roberts in California which is about halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles up in the hills in kind of the desert country. The largest uh, parade ground in the, in the Army, about a mile long, and uh, took basic training there. And then um, uh, was sent to, as part of the Army Special Ed Training Program, sent to school at Syracuse University. So those of us that were in that same group rode a troop train all across the U.S. from California to New York to Syracuse University uh, where we're going to pursue our school. We're in the Army, but we're going to go to class at the university. Uh, they had rented a number of old boarding and fraternity houses. I still remember for some reason 609 Comstock Avenue in Syracuse, which is where we where we live, and uh, went to, uh, to a college, college, Syracuse University for maybe a half a year or so, and then of all things, they canceled that program. <laughs> we were uh, all then ready to go into the regular army. Uh, actually, I was in, uh, as I say, in Syracuse University, they terminated that program, and uh, I was sent to uh, the uh, ordnance plant uh, in, uh, near Annapolis, the ordnance, uh, what's it called, I can't remember, but it was an army base, uh, uh, near Annapolis, and I was trained as a heavy artillery mechanic. These are people that, you know, worked on big guns. Uh, and so then after that, receiving that training, I was sent to California. That's what we'd call a replacement. I was kind of not in the unit, but I was an individual soldier waiting for some heavy artillery mechanic to get shot, and then I would go and take his place. So. I sat there and there was a rule that if you were not sent out in six or eight weeks, something like that, you were didn't have to stay there longer, they would send you back into the interior of the U.S. for some other program. So here I was, a heavy artillery mechanic, sent back for retraining as a an anti-aircraft gun repair person, and uh, I received that training in Mississippi at uh, Camp Flora in Mississippi. And then after that training, I was sent to Panama. I went to Universe, went to uh, New Orleans, got on a troop ship, and was sent to, to Panama to protect the canal. We were very well received as replacements because the people there had been there for four years or so without any kind of relief uh, protecting the canal. So they were sent back and we stayed, even though the, the war in, uh, in Europe ended uh, as we were on the ship going to Panama, and they they stopped the ship in the in the Mississippi River and waited for orders whether we would go on or you know down to there. Whether since the war was over, they didn't need us, we would come back. But apparently, they decided that uh, the war with Japan was still ongoing, even though it was a thousand miles away at that time. But they still needed troops at the Panama Canal, so they decided they would bring these people back that had been there for four years and send us down. So that's why I went on to Panama and was there for uh, a little over a year uh, until the war was really over and ultimately came home. After Panama I came home and uh, uh, was certainly glad to be out of the Army and everything like that and went back home and uh, went on to finish at, at A&M uh, in civil engineering. Uh, I think uh, uh, I took some summer classes because I was, you know, behind, uh, having been away, and uh, I did take off one summer, I remember very vividly, and went on and finished uh, my uh, uh, civil engineering degree at, at A&M.
The a &M had dances at Sabisa Hall, which is the big mess hall where they had dances, big orchestras, and uh, we would gather at the exit and some of these Aggies were leaving and we'd try to get their re-entry pass so we could go in to the dance and uh, enjoy dancing with the high school girls that we knew. <laughs> I was still at it was A&M. Somebody named Pat uh, was uh, getting ready to go to University of Texas uh, to enter the university. At that time I had moved to, I'd finished my law degree and was in Pampa, Texas, but I was visiting some people at home at College Station and in the, in the group where we were, we were gathering, uh, uh, that's where I met this girl that was getting ready to go to the, to the university. We all gathered at a place called Franklin's, which was a kind of an upsell uh, honky-tonk, I guess you'd say, uh, out on uh, the road to the airport. Uh, it was, uh, we went there even in high school and it was, it was a very uh, welcoming place. Uh, in high school, we could drink iced tea and not feel pressured to do anything else. But it, and it was it was the social gathering point for high schoolers. She was going off to college, and she was interested in the sorority and the college scene, and uh, so sort of ignored me for years. And then uh, after uh, after the war, I came back and was visiting uh, in in there and. Uh, that's when she uh, maybe changed her mind a little bit and would have a date with me or now down then. And that's kind of how that started. I graduated uh, from uh, A&M in a January, uh, and I remember going to law school the next week, starting the next week in law school. At that time, it was easy to get in law school. If you had a bachelor's degree, you could walk right in. No, <laughs> none of this LSAT or any of that stuff. It was just go oh, if you wanted to, <laughs> which was a great luxury And as I look back on it. I could have tried to go to Harvard or Yale or something, but having been away from home during the war years, I wanted to stay in Texas, and so, uh, as I say, it was easy to get in, so that's where I went. Uh, law school uh, was uh, a completely different instruction type, and. Uh, uh, than, than the other, and so I had to read cases. I was in a boarding house with some friends I knew, and so I, I studied very, very hard, not knowing what to do, and was pretty well prepared, and uh, made good grades in my first year in law school, which enabled you to be on the law review and, uh, and other uh, uh, honors, so to speak. I received a Honor of the or Order of the Coif, which is a top two percent of law graduates, and was on the law school, uh, the law review, and uh, stuff like that. Well, most of the graduates, top graduates at law school, went to Houston to work for the big three law firms in Houston, Baker Botts and the others. Um, for some reason, I decided I didn't want to practice law in a big city with a big firm. So what do I do? We, we had a very distant relative who had a small law firm in Pampa, Texas, out in the Panhandle near Amarillo. So of all things, I, he was he had a, a client who was in the real estate development business who had asked him to bring in a young lawyer to handle the affairs of that operation. So he was looking for a young lawyer and family connection and all, so he hired me. Uh, I remember going out there on the train <laughs> And uh, it was a long trip, but uh, uh, I did go out there, and uh, it was a very interesting experience. I worked there about five months. I went out in the spring of uh, 49, I guess, and uh, pretty much decided once we got there. Of course, I was married by then. And, no, I was, I was not married at that time. I was not married. I went out uh, to Pampa and uh, uh, rented a room in a, in, a, in a house owned by the sister of the lawyer that I was working for and uh, started working and I liked Pampa, a nice place, but I, there, there were lawyers that came out there from the big city and I saw them in operation and I decided I really would like to be in a, in a big city. So uh, 
I uh, started to uh, uh, look around in the city. I was I was I was married by then, I think, to uh, Pat Lynch, uh, and but we came to uh, to Dallas to visit a distant relative was Gerald C. Mann, who was a, a famous SMU football player in the 1920s, called the Little Red Arrow, and he had been. Uh, he had been uh, uh, the state's uh, attorney general, and uh, his practicing was in Dallas, and he was working for a man named Clint Markison. I'd never heard of Clint Markison, but I went to Dallas. I went to see him as a, just a matter of family courtesy, and he said, well, we've got this law firm here in Dallas that uh, you ought to go talk to them. They're just down the hall. So I uh, went and visited. Uh, at that time, there was a firm called Jenkins and Bowen, B O W E N, and uh, they had two other lawyers, and they were already looking for another lawyer. So I became the fifth lawyer at what was then called Jenkins and Bowen, later called Bowen, left to work for the Murkisons in a business capacity, and so it became Jenkins, Anson, Spradley, and that's where I went to work in uh, uh, the summer of. Uh, 1950, uh, and I became the, the fifth lawyer there, and uh, that firm prospered and survived for many, many years. Well, uh, as said, it was Jenkins Anson, Jenkins Anson Spradley, I guess, when I joined the firm. George Anson left the firm to become general counsel of First National Bank, so Jenkins and Spradley, and uh, then uh, I became uh, they did, just in the course of things, that was the way it worked. It then became Jenkins, Spradley, Gilchrist, and then Spradley left, and so uh, it was uh, Jenkins and Gilchrist. By that time, uh, firms had gotten away from the habit of having six or seven lawyers in their name and sort of institutionalized the name so that everybody that uh, was coming up deserving of being recognized wouldn't clamor to be in the name of the firm. So it pretty much stayed Jenkins and Gilchrist uh, for years, and so that's that's how it was. I was just lucky to be there at the right time. The firm uh, grew over the years uh, and had about a hundred. Uh, well, at one time we had uh, uh, lawyers in uh, in Austin, Houston, Dallas, uh, and had about. Uh, I know in Dallas we had a maybe close to. A, Hundred lawyers, uh, but at any rate, the Chicago office of uh, of Jenkins and Gilchrist uh, got involved in some tax matters, some litigation. They gave some what turned out to be faulty advice, and uh, that pretty much uh, destroyed the, the firm. And we didn't know what to do. But the Dallas office of about a hundred plus lawyers joined the firm of Hunt and Williams. Hunt and Williams is a long, long time, a Richmond, Virginia-based firm formed in about the 1900s. They had a very small office in Dallas, and so they were looking to expand, and we were looking to find a home, and so uh, we, we joined them, and it's, it's turned out to be very, very good for, for both of us. The, the firm uh, represented the, the Clint Murkison family, Clint Murkison Sr was one of Texas early oil men. Uh, he had two sons, uh, Clint Jr. and uh, John D. Murkison. They were all involved in the business. We uh, officed at 1201 Main Street. Those offices were on the first floor, and on the second floor they had space for the, for the law firm. So we were there uh, as an interesting satellite uh, facing Wayne, Main Street. Uh, when uh, Kennedy came to Dallas, uh, we all looked out there our window as we did on all parades that went down Main Street, and my father was here with me, and we uh, we watched the parade, and then we went across the street to Adolphus Hotel to have lunch, and that's where we heard about uh, the assassination. That was a very sad uh, weekend or day or year for Dallas. Well, one of the cases involved a proxy fight that was, uh, at the time, the largest proxy fight in the annals of American business. The uh, Murchison family had an interest in a company called IDS, Investors Diversified Service, in either Milwaukee or Minneapolis, I forget. 
uh, and uh, but also involved in that was a company called Allegheny Corporation that was in New York City. Uh, it was uh, had an also competing interest in that company, and uh, so there was going to be an annual meeting that was of stockholders that would determine whether the Murchison Group stayed in or got thrown out. And so that was uh, that was the proxy fight I mentioned. Uh, it involved uh, uh, dozens of consultants and big bucks. Several of our lawyers, probably three or four, went to New York and stayed for six or seven months. They had come back on weekends and go back on Monday or Sunday night. At least two of our secretaries went up there for an extended period of time to man. I know we had an office uh, there. Uh, I stayed here and uh, ran the rest of the office and other clients. Uh, but that was uh, the Murchisons at that time were our, basically our, our major client. And uh, the Murchison family won that proxy fight and uh, maintained control of, of that company. So that was one of the really highlights of the, of the uh, early years of the firm. Um, another, of course, was representing the Dallas Cowboys, uh, Clint Murchison. Junior. Well, I have to start back up. Clint Merchant Sr. was very interested in football. He tried for years to buy the Washington Redskins, but didn't, was not able to do that. But the league was going to expand, and Clint Merchant Jr., with the help of uh, George Hallis, who was the Chicago Bear big week, uh, got a franchise, an expansion franchise, for the Dallas Cowboys uh, in Dallas. Uh, and so that started uh, that year. He had Clint had hired Tech Schramm, uh, who was a, a legendary uh, sports person in Los Angeles to be the general manager, and they hired Tom Landry, uh, who at that time was uh, a defensive coach for the Chicago, I mean, the New York Giant team. So that, that started the franchise, and uh, the, the early years they played in the Cotton Bowl, of course, because no Texas Stadium. I remember vividly that uh, we could bet and I could uh, go to the Cotton Bowl Park right in front of the, of the fairgrounds and walk and maybe 10,000 people in, in the stadium would be a good crowd for an early, early game. Eddie LeBaron was the football, the quarterback, a uh, very short uh, quarterback, very talented, and uh, Don Meredith had been hired. Don was a SMU famous football player and he came and that was the the, the early team in, in the Cowboys. Uh, and so uh, it gradually grew, 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 grew with, with popularity and would fill the Cotton Bowl and that led ultimately to uh, Texas Stadium, which uh, Clint wanted the city, the Cowboys, to build a stadium for the Cowboys in uh, downtown Dallas. Uh, he was willing to commit the team to stay there for 30 plus years, uh, but the city fathers uh, and those that were interested in Fair Park wanted them to stay uh, in, in the, at the Cotton Bowl, and they thought he didn't have any other options, so they they squashed that deal. But Clint uh, outthought him. He went to Irving, met with the city council. We had a number of meetings. Uh, that was before the open meetings laws, and so you could meet at private at night with the city council people and worked out an arrangement to uh, build a Texas Stadium out at Irving. That was a very, very interesting project, of course, and uh, led to, uh, to many years of cowboy football in, in Texas Stadium. The, uh, the firm, uh, if it had a specialty, it was basically business law. We did not do much, uh, we didn't do any criminal law. We didn't, at that point, didn't have a trial section, and if we had a litigation matter, we farmed it out to other firms. And uh, beyond that, uh, those of us that were there did pretty much everything. We did not realize that uh, specialty was the, the vogue it is now, and whatever came in, we basically did. Well, business law is an adjunct of, uh, of basically business transactions. You uh, you can hardly do anything these days without legal advice. Uh, this is not have to do with trials or, uh, or criminal law or uh, things like that, but if you're having a, a transaction between one businessman and another, if you don't have a lawyer involved, you're asking for trouble. 
So that was that was our basic practice. We uh, we didn't know enough to be overly specialized, and if things came up, that's what we did, and uh, it worked out fine for us. We we were living in uh, in an apartment uh, near Cedar Springs and and near Dallas. That was a one bed bedroom apartment. I remember vividly. That's when Tom came along, and we had his crib in our bedroom, and he would. Uh, stand up when he could and look over at our bed and where we were. So uh, that was uh, time to move on. We bought a lot on Norway Road, just off Preston Road, uh, just across from uh, St. Mark's School. And uh, we hired our, our, my cousin, Art Swank, to design a house for us. Uh, he was a contemporary type architect and uh, uh, that's what we liked at the time. So that house is still standing, although it's been remodeled quite a bit. And uh, so he designed it, we built it. Uh, one of the features of it was a curved brick wall uh, in the front. And uh, some of the people said, that wall won't stand. And he said, go to Thomas Jefferson's house at Monticello and you'll see an identical wall that's been there for centuries. So we enjoyed that. Uh, one memory of that house, it had an open carport and uh, we had a birthday party for young Tom and uh, many of his friends, or several at least, climbed up on the roof of the carport and were playing around there to pets, uh, horror and, <laughs> and the surprise, but it worked out fine. Uh, we, uh, we, we liked that house, but we wanted to move into the Park Cities, which was primarily for school district, school purposes. And uh, so we, uh, we started looking at, at houses. We found this one house on Drexel that we ultimately bought it was built in 1914, uh, and it had been uh, occupied as a used as a rent house for the last five years. Uh, a recent tenant had five dogs inside the house. The paint was peeling off the walls on the staircase, and uh, we looked at it with arch. We liked the house, and so we we bought it. Our friends were horrified that we buy that house. It was just it, it was in shambles, so to speak, but. It was structurally sound, which we had found out, and so we undertook about a six-month or more remodel bit, replaced the the wiring, the plumbing, and everything virtually. But it was it was sound, and uh, we moved in there in uh, in uh, when Tom was in first grade. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was probably in second grade when we moved in there. I remember the in, Tom was in first grade at that time. Highland Park School District was, was very flexible and so even though we were not living in the Park Cities at the time, we bought a property and they allowed me to, as I went to work every day, to take Tom to school and drop him off and then Pat would pick him up afterward. Uh, by the time of uh, second grade, we, we had moved into the house and uh, that worked out fine because he could walk to school and walk back and it, was, it was, turned out to be a uh, Great investment, a, a wonderful property, uh, a lot of uh, fond memories of that of that house. We, uh, when Tom was in maybe junior high, we built on the back uh, an, an addition that had what we call the room. It was about a big room, about 20 feet by 28 feet, and big open space with a vaulted ceiling, and uh, a lot of parties there, a lot of time activities, and uh, it was uh, it was a great great, great place, but when, after everybody had left, the family had left and grown, that was way too big a house for, for Pat and me. So we, we looked around, actually we had bought this house on, on Lufton uh, several years before to, to look, you know, to have available when we were ready. We rented it for a couple of years and then uh, did some remodeling and updating and that's when we moved here and uh, sold the Drexel house. When we uh, moved to Dallas, there was no church shopping at all. We uh, went to Highland Park United Methodist Church, Highland Park Methodist Church at the time. The reason being that when my parents had lived in Dallas in the uh, 20s or early 30s, that's where they went to, to church. And uh, they actually built a house on Drexel Drive in the block south of the church. So uh, they had a very close tie to the church, that's just where we went. 
Uh, Mark Steele was the pastor and uh, we enjoyed the church. We joined the Sunday school class and uh, became very much involved in, in church activity. Pat was raised a Baptist. Uh, she agreed that I wouldn't want to be dunked and so she became a Methodist when we lived in, in Pampa and uh, she was a, you know, a very, very good Methodist and so that's where we went to church. They've always been going to church there. One of the pastors decided we needed a new, well, actually to back up, the sanctuary is too small but for our membership, but uh, uh, the sanctuary is very dear to many of the congregation and this, this pastor wanted a building committee. We hired an architect from uh, Kansas or Missouri, somewhere like that, and they designed a, a new sanctuary that would tear down the existing sanctuary and build a new sanctuary. It looked like uh, inside of an airplane hangar. It had an open ceiling with uh, trust work above and uh, it, was, uh, it was a radical departure. The, uh, the proposal to do that was soundly defeated, uh, very soundly defeated, and so that's when they did some minor remodeling on the sanctuary and uh, have added uh, other services. And we, I think we have 11 plus services at 11 o'clock on Sunday at the church. So we have plenty of opportunity for people to go to church. Uh, but the sanctuary is, is sacred and now I don't think anybody will fool with it anymore. And I was uh, somehow involved, knew Adeline Harrison, who was the early promoter of DART. She was uh, a local business lady and very well connected in the community. Uh, and so when DART started, I was named the first general counsel of DART. I knew nothing about transportation or running a, a, a system of transportation at all. Uh, and I was really there until we could hire a uh, in-house lawyer that knew what he was doing. So I was uh, very short term at JARP, but uh, I muddled through it and uh, was not embarrassed by anything. So that was, it's nice to be the first general counsel of DARP without having to do much. It was what I'd call a chamber of commerce for downtown Dallas to promote uh, downtown as a viable entity and, and whatever downtown needed uh, we would do. And uh, I was uh, uh, I was chairman of that for a couple of years and uh, that's when we were trying to uh, develop the arts district. Uh, the, the, the property that's now the arts district was uh, for sale owned by Borden's Deer Dairy and some developers were willing to buy it and build apartments and whatever and there was an effort on the part of the city to preserve it for the arts district so we got together with the major banks at that time First Republic and Mercantile. Uh, those banks historically had been the major force for Dallas and whenever they got together, they could make anything happen they wanted to. This was probably the last time that they really got together because the banks went different ways. But they got together and they arranged to borrow, to lend to a new organization which we call Central Business District uh, to buy the Borden property, to preserve it for a year or two until the city could have a bond election to buy the property and set it aside for an arts district. So that was a very exciting and unique uh, opportunity and uh, it, was, it was great fun to be involved in that uh, very important move for the city. Uh, as I mentioned earlier maybe, uh, my father was in town and he was visiting in our office. Our office was at 1201 Main Street, two-story building. Uh, the Murchison offices were on the ground floor and on the second floor overlooking Main Street was our law office. So we, we looked out the window as Kennedy's uh, uh, parade or a caravan went down Main Street and uh, we looked at that and then after they had passed we went over to the Adolphus Hotel to have lunch and we were, we were having lunch when they interrupted and told us that Kennedy had been shot and taken to uh, Parkland Hospital. Uh, and then later we learned that he had, he had died that cast a real pall on the city. I just remember uh, uh, going home and uh, everybody was uh, 
really depressed. Finally realized that we can stay in a funk for the rest of our life. So on, a, I guess it was Friday or Saturday night, we took the family and went out to dinner at a, just a low, low key uh, family restaurant. And uh, that's when the city started emerging uh, uh, from uh, from the trauma. Uh, of course, uh, uh, before Kennedy came, there had been an article in the newspaper published by some people that thought to be right-wingers. I think it was one of the Hunt family that uh, was thought to be kind of controversial. And so some people, uh, I would say the media elite from the Northeast, uh, during the term city, Dallas, the city of hate, put a lot of uh, pressure on us. So it took years for the city to sort of emerge from that, uh, that, uh, that image. And there were two things that uh, that did that. One was the Dallas Cowboys came along, and the other was the uh, the TV show Dallas, that uh, uh, really showed Dallas to the entire world. I remember uh, being in a conference room on our office that overlooked uh, uh, the, the next door building, and they were filming a, a, a segment of Dallas down there, and we had some people in the office that day from Sweden, and they, they saw that, and they became so excited they called them back to the home office <laughs> and told them what they were watching. <laughs> and uh, that really, uh, really brought Dallas out of its funk and uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great after the time. People ask me if I go to work every day and I say I go to the office every day. Uh, work is something I do some, but I'm not, and the firm is very generous to me, I'm not pressured to do a number of billable hours, but I have some clients that I work with, and uh, I have sort of a, an ideal life for someone that's almost 88 years old. I seem to be in good health. I get up, breakfast here, uh, have a nice house, and then I drive to work and I go to work. I don't have to get there too early. I have a secretary that's very, very supportive, and uh, I come lunch and work some and whatever. I come home usually to two to three in the afternoon and lounge around. So uh, I, I'm fine. I have two children, as you know, that uh, monitor me and I'm, uh, I'm not left alone sitting in the dark at all. It's, it's great. When I uh, got out of law school and was, uh, you know, entering adulthood and thinking about uh, the future, uh, I had met Pat in, uh, in College Station with some other people and I uh, I focus on the fact that our families were very similar, we were Christian based, and uh, we had we had similar views, similar values, and uh, uh, my biggest goal and objective was to get her to accept me. So uh, I was uh, not involved romantically with anybody else. I was in uh, in uh, Pam in Pampa practicing law. She had uh, uh, been. Uh, uh, I guess by then through the University of Texas and uh, sort of indicated that uh, maybe she was willing to uh, uh, accept me. I think probably her father and mother uh, were my biggest advocates for, for her. But at any rate, uh, we did get together and we, uh, we uh, got married in, uh, in Bryan at the First Baptist Church, which was her home church. We had a wedding reception actually the first major event in the new Memorial Student Center at a &M, Texas A&M Penn College. Uh, we had uh, a nice reception there and uh, a friend of my father's from San Antonio uh, had an airplane and he arranged to fly us to Austin where we were going for our honeymoon. So uh, we were taken to the airport and uh, uh, flew to Austin. I uh, stayed at the, uh, uh, I think it was the Driscoll, Austin Hotel or the Driscoll, or no, there was another, I don't know where it was, but at any rate, we were there, uh, and that was the, the start of our, our marriage. But at any rate, we had a, we had a, a good time and back at the, uh, uh, at the, at the game, and uh, uh, we, we enjoyed it, and uh, that was, uh, then after that, back to, to Pampa, to, uh, 10 hours away by car, 
uh, no air conditioning. When we would go in the summer, we would buy a bucket of ice and put between us to sip on the ice as we went back and forth. Children, of course, we wanted children, and the first child was Tom, uh, born on April 11, 1954, named Thomas Gibb Gilchrist, the Gibb being my father's name. And uh, Tom uh, was sort of a compromise between John and Mark and whoever, but uh, Tom, so Thomas Gibb Gilchrist, uh, number one child. Uh, two and a half years later, exactly, uh, daughter Terry came along. She was named Terry Lynn Gilchrist. Uh, I'm not sure where that name came from, but probably Pat picked it out. But uh, the two children have been a joy to us. Uh, we never had any serious problem with them drinking drugs or misbehaving or anything like that. Normal, uh, uh, you know, raising children is a problem, but uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great pleasure. I'm certainly glad we did. And uh, with Tom, we're blessed with two grandchildren, which is really wonderful. Saturday was, of course, a day uh, not of work, and uh, routinely uh, Tom and I would go to Braden's Bakery over near Knox Street and buy orange uh, muffins or whatever it was called and come back and have uh, a nice breakfast there. And then uh, most Sunday, Saturdays, uh, we'd go to uh, Sears on Ross Avenue for a Dr. Pepper and just uh, an outing. So that was kind of a a routine, not very exciting in today's world, but uh, that was uh, that was a family time, and we we enjoyed it. At least I did, and Tom tolerated it. Uh, I wouldn't go to the fair without Tom or somebody. Uh, very nice routine. First stop is Fletcher's Corny Dog, uh, and then uh, through the uh, automobile building to look at the new cars. Even though I haven't bought a new car in quite a few years and don't plan to, but it's, it's part of the routine. Terry is, uh, of course, a, a delight of our life. She is, uh, uh, was, was, was very much involved in, in, in theater and in, in high school and uh, was in a number of plays. Uh, both Tom and Terry were in Lads and Lassies uh, musical group in high school and that uh, that's, uh, that was uh, sort of shaped their lives to be involved in music and things like that. Uh, Terry is uh, married to a Cajun from New Orleans, Chester, and uh, he is uh, wonderfully tolerant and very, very nice son-in-law. Uh, we, uh, we, we enjoyed the family very much. When I was, uh, I was uh, raised a Methodist, not ever thought about anything else. The family was a Methodist. Uh, and uh, when uh, we got married, of course, <laughs> it was in the Baptist church, but that was sort of a, uh, because that was Pat's home church, uh, she recognized that she needed to be a Methodist. And uh, uh, I was living in Pampa at the time, and when we came back from a honeymoon and went to Pampa, she joined the, the Methodist church there and was uh, dutiful. Methodist all her life. She uh, loves to sing. She knows the words to most uh, hymns and uh, is, uh, we, we have been involved in the Sunday school class uh, in, in the church uh, forever. Uh, of course, nobody can claim to be perfect spiritually, but uh, we have, uh, I think, done a reasonably good job of, of guiding, guiding God guiding our lives. I don't recall a philosophy. I think uh, uh, you kind of deal with it as it as it comes along, uh, and uh, we uh, if there's anything we were we were there for our children, and we uh, very much involved in, in their activities. Uh, I remember even in first grade uh, going to Armstrong and watching Tom and Terry uh, uh, in in their activities and. Uh, so we were, uh, we were always there and uh, uh, very fortunate to not have any real problems with, with, with us or with our children. Two special people were the lawyers that I worked for, both in Tampa and in, in Dallas, uh, Curtis Douglas. He was a 2S Douglas and uh, 
distant relative. Uh, so my grandmother on my father's side was a Douglas, and so there was a family connection there with so-called Douglas people. My uh, mother was raised in Cumbie, and uh, her brother still lived there. He was postmaster, and almost every, every year, virtually the next day after school was out, we would get on the train uh, in Austin, the Katy, uh, go to Greenville, Texas, and that's where my brother would meet us and drive us down to Cumbie, which is about 16 miles east of Greenville. And we would spend uh, a good part of the summer there in, in Cumbie. Uh, there were some people that lived next door and around that were fun to play with in, in the summer. And uh, my uh, uncle was, as I say, postmaster. I would go uh, up to the post office uh, many days and, uh, and spend part of the day just in the post office with him. Uh, I very recall recently that uh, the Black Crystal Boys were in Dallas for a concert. And I remember vividly that uh, they were on the radio and uh, we would listen to the Light Crystal Boys virtually every day playing uh, uh, with W. Lee, Pappy O'Daniel and uh, the Light Crystal Boys and that was, uh, that was part of the routine that I, I grew up with. There was of course no TV and uh, the radio, uh, I don't remember listening to it routinely at home but uh, up there at Cumby we would listen to it uh, during the, the day. Of course he was in the post office and uh, not busy all the time, and it just had the radio on. I remember uh, listening to it. Well, uh, Mom and I, on our 40th anniversary, we had a, a, a function at the Dallas Women's Club for a number of people, and so that was a prelude to our 50th anniversary. And on that day, we had a really, really neat function. Uh, Tom and Terry uh, provided entertainment. They did a whole show all by themselves that. Uh, uh, if you look at the picture over there, there's Mom laughing at that at that show. She really, really enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun, and uh, we were looking forward to maybe 60th, but we missed it by a couple of years. But uh, great memories of all of that. I'd probably say uh, El Phoenix, although I like uh, seafood. Uh, but I don't have a favorite seafood place at, at all. And and I like the petroleum club. The food there is, is excellent. Oh, I do. I love hot brow. I forgot hot brow. There was a, there is, was a hot brow in Austin when I was in law school. And uh, I would go there on occasion. And uh, so when they built one here, I was very excited. And uh, I really enjoy hot brow. I do. And Tom will go with me and he pretends to like it too. So. <laughs> she loved to travel, and I guess I regret not traveling more with her, but uh, it was one of those things that uh, always came up. She loved to travel. I'm, I'm a like uh, creature comforts. I don't really enjoy traveling all that much. I mean, I'd go to College Station or New York where you just three hours away from comforts, but uh, you know, going where you got to go through hassles to do this or that. I've, I've never enjoyed that. So uh, I've enjoyed uh, being in Hawaii, which is her parents moved out there and we visited them. Uh, I enjoyed Estes Park where we went with uh, Tom and Terry. Uh, I'll mention real quick one of Tom's uh, adventures at Estes Park. Uh, they had activities for the children and to get them out of the parents' uh, way. And we sent Tom to a crafts class uh, one day. He came back with a tool leather belt with initials on the back, and it was R N. <laughs> and he said, Why did you do that? And he said, well, "That's the only letters that were still available." <laughs> and we 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 hit him with that over and over again, of course. But uh, we enjoyed Estes Park. Enjoyed uh, going to College Station, uh, and. Uh, Later, New York City. New York City. I do. We had a, had a client that uh, had a meeting in New York every fall, and we really enjoyed going there, going early, seeing some Broadway shows and things like that. I, I really, we, we, and even I enjoyed that type of travel and activity. First year we were in Dallas, we decided we'd get some culture, and Mom and I went to see three operas in one weekend. And 
that was enough for my lifetime. I've never been back to the opera since, but I told Tom that I thought anybody could write a country western song, and uh, he sort of challenged me, and so I did one. It's called Unemployed Lovemaker. <laughs> And I think it's, uh, it would be a world-class hit if it just got the right backing or singer. I can't even get Tom to sing it, <laughs> but uh, that's, my, that's my songwriting. <laughs> In Dallas, I belong to the uh, Dallas Petroleum Club, and uh, that's, uh, that is uh, obviously a, a lunch dinner club, and I belong to uh, Dallas Country Club. Oh, Dallas, the Dallas Country Club, which uh, I joined many, many years ago when it was very reasonable. I, I've played golf there maybe twice in, <laughs> over the years uh, and uh, uh, go there for lunch, but I, I don't use it enough to, to justify the cost. But uh, uh, to be honest, I keep that because uh, now and then I do need it. and. Uh, it's my fond hope that granddaughter Ellie will have a wedding reception there someday. Uh, we mentioned the radio on Sunday night in uh, in Austin. Uh, we would listen to Jack Benny and Fred Allen, and uh, if there was another one, I don't remember, but always Jack Benny uh, on Sunday night. That was just just a regular routine. I don't remember listening to much other radio. And of course, TV didn't come along until many, many years later. Uh, and uh, my favorite TV show would be—I'd uh, have to stop and think. I don't—I don't have one. I just have to see. Murder She Wrote. But I, oh yeah, I like Murder <laughs> She Wrote. Frazier. Angela Lansbury, Frasier. And uh, today I would watch uh, some of the news programs, and uh, but. Uh, it's more a diversion now than it is, you know, something I have to have to see. I do watch the news. To be true to your to your values, don't don't compromise uh, your core values. Uh, work hard, cultivate uh, people, be nice to people, uh, and uh, help people when you can, and uh, lead a balanced life. Certainly, be involved in your church and your civic life and other organizations if you can. That's, that's enough advice for anybody. Well, I should have bought a certain stock years ago at a dollar a share. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, uh, I, don't, I don't have any regrets. I don't live and dwell in the past and uh, I think I'm reasonably optimistic and, and realize I'm fortunate to be where I am. So I, I'm, I'm reasonably pleased with, uh, with the life we've had and I've been blessed in, in many ways.